Radical Expressions, Where Have You Been All My Life? Radical Expressions is what we're going to focus in on here. And this specific lecture, we're just going to talk about the concepts behind simplifying ra radicals. In a future lecture, we'll actually go into a ton of examples of simplifying radical expressions. But this is the important lecture of the two, because this one will learn all the reasons why we simplify radicals the way we do and also talk about uh, some of the more advanced topics in, in the concepts behind simplifying radicals. A couple prereqs here, you should know everything about exponents. The laws of exponents, you should know about negative exponents, you should know about rational exponents, uh, you should know pretty much everything I've talked about up to this point with exponents, but if you're not following my lecture series, well, eh, then it's hard for you to know what I've talked about. You should also know what a radical is and how to take roots of numbers, cube roots of numbers, that type of thing, and work with radicals a little bit. Although up to this point, I haven't even simplified a single radical expression. Really, the concept behind simplifying radicals stems from these, this one theorem, which really can be written as two theorems, I suppose. You have one, two. They're really saying the same thing. The nth root of the product of two numbers a and b is equal to the nth root of a times the nth root of b. In other words, you can split multiplication. And that's actually the theorem we're going to be using the most with radicals when we simplify radicals, is splitting radicals into the product of two other radicals. But something to really note here is that most textbooks say that this split can only occur if a and b are both positive or zero. Uh, and it, it actually is true. You can only do this if A and B are positive most of the time. There are times when you can actually do it when A or B is negative, but that only occurs if the index on the radical is odd. And I'll give you an example of that. Actually, I'll go ahead and give you an example of that right now. The reason why this is stated, this number one is stated, is that let's talk about the, f the second root. Let's just talk about the square root. It's much easier for people to see. The square root of 4, well, we all know that's going to be 2, but if you were to say, oh, that's like the square root of a negative 2 times a negative 2, right? Which is actually 4. But negative 2 times negative 2 is 4. So those two th should be the same, and they are, until you split it like this. The square root of a negative 2 times the square root of a negative 2. This is actually a no-no. You can't do this because this theorem is telling me I can't do this. What we split it into, they both have to be positive. The reason why is because, look, the square root of negative 2 is not a real number, so I can't really compute this. I mean, I can if you know uh, imaginary numbers, you can, you can do this, but if you did this, you wouldn't get the same answer. For those who know imaginary numbers, uh, you can pay attention to what I'm about to say. If you know what imaginary numbers are, you could say, oh, this is like the square root of 2 times i times, well, the square root of 2 times i, which would be i squared times root 2 times root 2 is 2, but i squared is a negative 1, so that would be a negative 2, which is not what the square root of 4 is. Square root of 4 is actually a positive 2. So that's the issue with splitting a number like positive 4 into two, the product of two negative numbers. But we can get around this if the index is odd. So let's talk about that. Now, this is not something a lot of authors worry about, but let's just look at the cube root of, uh, let's do the cube root of something like a negative 8. Because I know what the cube root of negative 8 is. The cube root of negative 8 is negative 2. That's because negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2 is going to be negative 8. And in fact, before I continue, I, I just thought of the fact that I might want to do this using a different number. So let me do a negative 216 instead. Sorry about that, but the only reason why I do this is because I want to prove a point here. Well, 216, I don't know the third root of that offhand, but I do know that 216 is like, well, 8 times 27. So that'll be like a negative 8 times a positive 27. You can check it in the calculator. That's actually what it, it goes into. And so I could break this apart into the cube root of a negative 8 times the cube root of positive 27. 
And when I do this, well, the cube root of negative 8 is a negative 2. The cube root of 27 is a positive 3. That's going to be a negative 6. Now, let's check our work here. Negative 6 times negative 6 is a positive 36. And multiply that times a negative 6. Well, it looks like I'm saying minus. So let's just multiply that by a negative 6. It'll be a negative. Uh, let's see, 6. Uh, that'll be 3. 180 plus, or I'm sorry, 18 plus another 3 is 21, so negative 216, which is exactly what we want it to be right there. So it turns out the negative 6 is the cubit of negative 216, and we were allowed to actually break it apart into a negative number times a positive number. So here's the major rule here, is that you, in general, you, you can always split as, well, you can always split if the interiors are both positive. So if you split it into a positive and a positive, that's absolutely fine. But there is a little exception to the only positive rule, and that's if your index is odd. And you can see why just from uh, just from this example down below. Because odd indices allow us to take cube roots or fifth roots or roots of negative numbers. Now that was a lot of justification, but now I can actually talk about part two of this theorem pretty quickly. Part two is saying the same thing that part one is. It's basically saying that you can split division. Well, division and multiplication are intimately tied, so uh, it should be pretty obvious that you can split division as long as you can split multiplication. So you can split division as long as, again, the interiors are positive. And there's an additional little condition that B can't be zero. Well, of course, you can't divide by zero. So conceptually, this is what's what's happening. Now, <clears throat> I want to mention one other thing before I, I move on here. The one thing I don't want you to take away from this, you can split multiplication, you can split division, but you can't split addition or subtraction. You cannot split addition or subtraction. So let me put that in written form. So there we have it in big red lights there. You cannot split addition or subtraction under a radical. And I'll give you a simple example as to why. Let's take a look at the radical, the square root of 9 plus 16. And I did this in a previous lecture as well, but I think it's good enough to see it here again. We know that we can follow the order of operations here. The order of operations says add those two numbers. So this should actually be the square root of 25. And we all know the square root of 25 is just a positive 5. Okay. But if we were to suppose incorrectly, so let me write does not equal here. But if we were to suppose incorrectly that we could split it, you'll see something wrong happens. Whoops, that's wrong in and of itself. Well, we would split it to the square root of 9 plus the square root of 16. Well, the square root of 9, that equals 3. The square root of 16, that's equal to 4, so that would be 7. Notice that we know the real answer is supposed to be 5. Had we split the square root, the addition amongst the square root, then we would have got the answer 7, which is absolutely wrong. The same thing for uh, subtraction. You can't split subtraction. So I will often see students do silly things like this. Oh, I have the square root of x squared plus 4, and they go, oh, that's just x plus 2. It's not x plus 2, because what you're doing there is you're saying, oh, that's like the square root of the first thing plus the square root of the second thing. In other words, you're splitting the square root. You can't do that. We do not have a theorem that says we can split square roots uh, when we have additions or subtractions. Now, I sincerely hope that kind of sticks with you. And now, in the next video lecture, I'm going to be talking quite a bit about simplifying radicals. So let me just go over again what it means to simplify a radical expression. So we have some radical expression. It might be just a single term, or it could be adding a couple radicals, or it could be multiplying a few radicals, whatever it may be. But we want to know what it means to simplify the radical. A radical is considered simplified if all four of these conditions are met. Each factor in the radicand is to a power that's less than the index of the radical. In other words, a good simplification is if you had something like, oh, I don't know, the fourth root of uh, 3x to the third. Notice the power on this is less than the, the index on the radicand. A bad simplification would be like the fourth root of 3x to the seventh. Notice this power here is much greater than the power on the index. 
So, or the number of the index. So this tells me that this can be simplified further. Can be simplified further. We'll talk a little bit about that when we get in the next lecture. Next thing is that the radicand cannot contain fractions or negative numbers. So this is okay, the square root of 3 over 2, but this is not okay, the square root of 3 fourths is not okay. Well, I should have written that, that in red. So the rule of thumb is that you can't have a radical that contains a fraction because then you would that's considered unsimplified. You have to simplify that even further. The topic that I have grayed out here, all denominators must be rationalized, that's actually a throwback to the olden days when we didn't have calculators that we'd have to require all fractions to have rationalized denominators. I'll talk about that when we get there, but th that's actually a throwback to olden times. We don't have to do that anymore. And then the final thing is that each term in an, an expression contains only one radical. So the following is okay, but and if you notice, there are two terms here, and each term only has one radical. But the next one is not okay. Notice both those terms have radicals in them. So we'll learn that that's totally not cool. We like to combine these up, glue these together. It looks a lot better when you do that anyway. So we'll learn that skill in the next lecture.